I'd like to actually go ahead and get started and, and, and welcome our, our keynote speaker who really needs no introduction. Uh, he's the author of, of D3JS, which I'm sure changed most of our lives, uh, and a graphics editor for the New York Times where he's been really pushing the boundaries of, of interactive storytelling. Um, and so uh, if, you, if you could give me a hand welcoming Mike Bostock to the stage. So I've always wanted to give a talk about design, um, but I've always hesitated to give that talk. And the reason for that is I really don't feel that I'm that good at um, design, which is not to say that I'm not proud of some of my work, but design has this tendency to feel very capricious, which is that some days you feel like you are a master of design and things are going pretty well. And then other days, um, most days, you tend to feel more like a neophyte where you're not really sure what's going wrong or how to solve your problems or why everything is so hard. Um, and I think uh, Paul Ford recently tweeted this, and I think it sort of like summarizes my sentiments pretty closely. So one commonality between writing and coding is that everything you do is in a nightmarish state of total failure until the moment it is not. Uh, and he, was, he wasn't writing about design directly, but if you look at this first reply, sounds like design. I mean, this is like exactly the sentiment that I feel. And so if you end up talking about your process and talking about design, there's this fear that you will discover that there is no method to the madness and that whatever past success that you've had isn't really the result of any underlying reason. It's just lightning striking. It's happening to be lucky. And so when we talk about our own work, it's convenient to sort of ignore all of that intermediate failure and the mistakes that were made and that uncertainty and just to just look at the, the polished end result uh, and to brush away those mistakes that were made. And, and that sort of lets you pretend that you know what you're doing. But of course, that's not really helpful if you want to learn design. I think if you want to learn design, it's helpful to understand that everyone um, struggles with it and, and makes mistakes. So I'm going to talk about design anyway, um, because I know at least one thing about design, which is that we collectively do not know many things about design. Um, but to phrase that in a less Rumsfeldian way, I'm going to say that design is hard. Um, and it is, because design is hard, it is challenging to articulate sort of these effective design principles. You know, they require careful interpretation, um, thoughtful application, and ultimately you, you never even know if the design principles that you hold dear are the reasons for your success. Um, so what I'm going to talk about is not so much these design principles, but instead um, how we can establish a process for design that, that recognizes the inevitability of failure and the necessity of trial and error. Um, so the title of this talk and the thesis of this talk is that design is a search, a search problem, which is to say that um, we have these principles for design and they are necessary to guide us, but they're also not sufficient. They don't dictate what a successful design will be. They're not blueprints. Um, there are ultimately too many unknowns um, for the principles to be sufficient to tell us exactly what we need to do. And so what we need in a successful design process is to be able to explore as many of these possibilities uh, as efficiently as possible so that in whatever time that we have because we're always facing particular deadlines you know whether it's a daily graphic that we're working on or sort of a longer term project where we might have a couple weeks or even a month um, we we need to be able to spend a lot of time exploring things that aren't going to work in order to find the things that do work um, and that hopefully if you have a robust creative process like this that you can succeed uh, even if you don't know what you're doing like me um, so first, I guess I should clarify like what I mean by hard, because there are lots of things that are hard, and uh, design is sort of hard in a particular way. Um, so other things that are hard are you know like famous theorems in, in mathematics or you know efficiently querying large amounts of data. And the thing, however, that is peculiar or particular about design is that you can't really reduce it to a simple logical system that you can make provable assertions about it, right? So if, if you think about um, computer science, so like a particular problem like, like sorting, there are various optimal like n log n algorithms for sorting an array of numbers. And you can choose between those different algorithms based on whatever constraints your problem has, like whatever performance characteristics you want to optimize for. 
Um, and so in this slide here is a, a visualization of quicksort, which is a, probably one of the most common ones. And so each of these little lines here, the, the ones that are leaning left are the smaller numbers, the ones that are leaning right are the larger numbers. And the way that quicksort works is that it's called, it's a partition exchange algorithm. So each of these cyan groups are the active partition. And then within that, there's a magenta or line which represents the pivot. And so at each step of this process, it's finding the numbers that are larger than the pivot and moving those to the right of the pivot. So I'll repeat that again so that you can see how it works. Um, now, there are lots of variations of quicksort as well and lots of other sorting al algorithms. Like, for example, you have this one is, is using a random pivot. There's other ones that do like median of three. There's even a cool one that does dual pivots at the same time. It's amazing. Um, but the point is like, you know, you have all of these different, um, oops, sorry, different sorting algorithms and they have different characteristics like, you know, merge sort uh, recursively partitions the array as well, but each of those um, partitions can then be sorted in parallel because it's gonna be sorting each of those partitions and then merging them together and each of those partitions can be done separately and then the merge statements are combined. So the point is, there's lots of things that are uncertain in computer science as well, opportunities for creative problem solving. But at the same time, many of these problems can be reduced to these logical systems about which we can make very strong statements. And even if we can't you know, prove that a particular approach is optimal, at the very least, it's easy for us to make empirical observations you know, where we can measure the performance of this particular approach on data um, and, and decide what is right for us. Um, but in design, it's a lot harder to do that. And so instead, we have um, you know, a lot of collective wisdom and we have a lot of principles, um, but things tend to be uh, much more subjective. So even the whole concept of you know, what is good or what is optimal design is subjective. You know, something that might work well for, for one person or for one audience might not work for other people. Um, some technique that might work well in one situation might you might think it would work well in another situation, but there's some other sort of hidden factor going on that prevents that approach from working. Um, which is not to say that there isn't a whole slew of useful information, swath of collective wisdom that you have to internalize and apply in your work, but it's, you also have to understand the, the limitations of that. And to sort of reinforce this concept, I wanna take a little blurb from Dieter Rams, um, who understood this problem all too well. So this is from the Vitsu website. Back in the early 1980s, Dieter Rams was becoming increasingly concerned by the state of the world around him, an impenetrable confusion of forms, colors, and noises. Aware that he was a significant contributor to that world, he asked himself an important question, is my design good design? As good design cannot be measured in any finite way, he set about expressing the 10 most important principles for what he considered was good design. Sometimes they are referred to as the 10 commandments. I, I think that maybe is a little strong statement from the marketing team there, but um, I, I think to me what this says is like if the, the best designer in the world doesn't know whether his designs are good, I mean, how is it possible for like schlubs like you and me to, to figure out our own designs? Um, so, but it, again, it's not to say that these principles aren't useful, it's just that they're not sufficient. So one of the 10 commandments, um, the 10th commandment in fact, that I think has been very influential to me and is something that I like to apply to my own work, so I want, I want to read that to you as well. Um, good design is as little design as possible, less but better, because it concentrates on the essential aspects and the products are not burdened with non-essentials. Back to purity, back to simplicity. So this is a very important principle, but again, it's not a recipe for success, right? We have to take this as sort of a philosophical viewpoint and figure out how to apply it to our own, work, our own work. But it's not really an instruction that says, you know, given the particular problem that we're facing, you know, this is what you should do. I mean, all of us want our work to be simple. The problem is we don't know how to do it, right? Um, so that, that is what makes these principles difficult to apply. And so the reality is like, no matter how well you master these principles, there will always be some exploration and some failure which is required. Um, now there are other scientific principles in design as well that are important to know. So does anybody recognize this equation? Anyone want to yell it out? Very good, yes. So this is Fitt's law. 
So this is uh, a way that we can estimate the difficulty of a pointing action, so such as like moving the mouse towards a, to clicking on a button or navigating a sequence of drop-down menus. So T here stands for the movement time to perform that action. A and B are these empirical constants that sort of like are functions of the device that you're using, like how long it takes you to, to start moving it and how quickly it moves. Um, but the ones that are important as far as design are concerned are D, which is the distance to the target, and W, which is the width of the target along the vector of movement. And so the intuitive explanation of Fitt's law is that targets that are bigger and closer are easier to click on, which is fairly obvious. Um, but it's still extremely useful to understand um, objectively that that is true, and also to be able to quantify sort of exactly how important that, uh, or how, how exactly changes in our design can influence our ability to perform those actions. Um, so to give you an example of how we apply this law, uh, this is a graphic done by Sean Carter, Kevin Quayle, and Joe Ward for the New York Times um, about strikeouts over the last uh, 110 years in baseball. And so each of the dots here on the screen, there's like 2,300 of them, um, are the, I think it's the average number, or the number of strikeouts per game on average per team by year. Um, so you can see how sort of as a cloud and with also the league average shown in blue there, how that's been changing over time and increasing dramatically. But if you, you can, this isn't interactive, this is just a screenshot, um, but you can mouse over this and sort of get detailed statistics about a particular team, like you can see in 2005, the Oakland Athletics, uh, five, about five strikeouts per game. Um, but if you were to mouse over each of these things individually, each of these dots is a radius of three pixels, so there's tiny little things to click on or to mouse over, and so what we do instead is we overlay this Voronoi diagram and a Voronoi diagram is, is simply a way that identifies the closest point to the mouse so that you can simply with you know, mouse over and mouse out events um, identify the closest point. And effectively what this does is take all of those tiny little circuit circles and make them much larger targets so that they're easier to interact with. So we can quantify that by looking at a histogram of those target sizes. So the, the cyan, or sorry, the magenta line here is the, the default size of those circles, the three pixel radius, and the gray bars here show the distribution of target sizes after we've applied the, the Voronoi overlay. Um, you can see that there are some targets that are actually smaller than those three pixel circles, but that is because those circles were overlapping. And so in, it was, in fact, it's even worse if you don't have the Voronoi diagram because you're not able to click on those or hover over those circles at all. And so when you have those tiny little circles together, you can still differentiate those um, with the Voronoi diagram. Um, so that's another important way that we can sort of improve the usability of our graphics through these design principles. Um, so ultimately, design's difficulty or complexity comes from these human factors. Like the reason we can't reduce it to just the simple logical system is that even the smallest problem in design requires understanding aspects of cognition of psychology, of perception. You know, it's really like a biological problem rather than just a, a mathematical problem. So we've come a long way from phrenology. That's what the background illustration is, like this idea that, that different parts of our discrete regions of our brain are responsible for different emotions or, or aspects of our psychology. We use these cranometers to like measure your head and identify what your particular problems were. Obviously, we know a lot more than that. Um, but there's still a lot that we don't know, um, and that is what makes design difficult. And so then the reality is a designer, you know, it, it, when you start out a particular project, um, you know, the naive approach is that you would just proceed linearly from where you are to where you want to be. Um, but because there is so much that we don't know, even if we have good principles, um, we, we can't take that approach in practice, and therefore our process has to reflect that. So the reality for, oh, uh, slide was like, let me start over, okay. So the reality of the design space is, is more like this, right, where we have a maze that we need to explore, where there are various, uh, we, we want to proceed to our destination, but we ultimately don't know how to get there. And the only information that we have is sort of like this local space around us, like where we can immediately go next. But we don't know sort of where the different approaches will dead end or what roadblocks we will run into or ultimately how successful any particular 
approach will be. Um, now, as an aside, I was like making this slide. Um, so this is using what's called Prim's algorithm for, for making these mazes. And these little dots here, the magenta dots, represent the frontier. And so the way that this algorithm works is for each cell that's in the frontier, you, know, you can explore from any existing passageway. You can go up, down, left, or right. And all that this algorithm does is that it, it randomly picks a new cell to expand. And it does not expand any cell that would then reconnect with an existing passageway. And so the result of this mage, or the result of this process, is a maze which completely fills the space, but which is also what's called a minimal spanning tree. So none of the different passageways reconnect again. So starting at the bottom left corner, it's basically a tree that branches out and, and fills this entire space. So what we need then really is an algorithm for exploring this design space efficiently. So one possible algorithm for that is called breadth first search, which is similar to how the maze is constructed in the first place. And so in this case, basically what we're doing is we're just going out exhaustively searching the entire maze, um, picking up a new sort of open point on the frontier. And then the magenta line here is just simply keeping track of the best path that we've taken so far. And so ultimately, this will find a solution. You, know, you will get to the top right corner of the screen. But you can see that you need to explore the entire maze in order to get there. And uh, in practice, obviously, we don't have time to consider every possible uh, design before we finally publish something. So really then, uh, just like we need a better algorithm for exploring this maze, we need a better process for exploring our designs. Um, so an alternative to this is called best first search. And what this does is it keeps track of um, the frontier again, shown in, in cyan. But it only goes down the frontier that currently seems the most likely to succeed. So it keeps a, a queue, a priority queue, of those different cells. And sort of as it explores, if it finds that it's now worse than one of the other cells that are in the frontier, it switches paths and goes to, goes to try the other solution. Um, now, you can see this definitely goes down some dead ends and doesn't succeed. This particular path was pretty successful. But if I try it again, you can sort of see more or less successful approaches. So this is really, yeah, this is pretty bad. <laughs> um, so, but it's just a heuristic. I mean, uh, there are like probably more uh, advanced algorithms that we could apply, certainly more information that we could use here. I'm using very limited information in this particular algorithm. But I'm just including this because it kind of looks cool. Uh, and it's, I think, a helpful analogy to understand the problem that we face um, in design. So really, in, in terms of our process, you know, we have two things that we can do. We can go faster, which is sort of like the brute force approach. And we can go smarter, which is about sort of like best first search, best first search which is about applying our principles and biasing our exploration so that we pursue those possibilities that seem the most promising. And we spend more time exploring those and less time exploring the ones that are more likely to fail. Um, now, just a little aside, as I was making this, like, you can do another thing which is cool, um, which is that you can fill it, but then you color each of the cells with the hue. So this is a rainbow color scale. Um, but, but whatever, it looks cool. <laughs> um, so I just like watching that. <laughs> All right. OK. So I've talked a lot about sort of philosophy, but now I want to um, talk practice and sort of try to show you how I apply this concept or apply this process in, in our work. Um, so I'm going to show you a video of a graphic that I worked on with Hayon Park and Jeremy Ashkenis. Um, and this is a little video. This is going to be pretty fast and uh, might be like epilepsy warning. I'm not sure how flashy it will be. Um, so watch out. Still playing here?
All right. So that was every commit uh, in the Git repo for this project as a screenshot, shown in 38 seconds. I think it's like fifth of a second per commit or something like that. Um, so this graphic is called Taking the Battle to the States. And it was about looking at um, sort of how single party control of both the uh, executive branch of the states, the governor's office, and the, legis the state legislature um, affected that state's policies. So which policies were passed under that? So if you have um, Republican Party controls both the state legislature and the governor's office, you, sort of, you might think they would be more likely to pass conservative policies. And likewise, if you have Democrats controlling both of these branches of government, you might expect them to be passing more liberal policies. Um, so it's fairly complicated because you have these two different dimensions you're trying to look at, um, um, two different sort of ordinal dimensions, right? You have the policies ranging from liberal to conservative, and then you have the control of government being Republican or Democrat. Um, and then you have all of these different policies area policy areas that you're looking at. I mean, you're only seeing the top two here, but I think there's something like 10. And then you have uh, you know, the population of the states, because like, the states vary greatly in population, so you don't necessarily want to weight them all equally when you're looking at the overall behavior. And then people also like looking at maps, because they want to understand the geography. So there's a lot of things going on here. Um, I, I'm not sure that this is necessarily like, the best graphic that I've worked on, but I'm including it because um, I think it illustrates sort of all these like wild explorations at the beginning that look nothing like the final graphic and are really like disasters. Like I don't even know what that was trying to show. Um, there is one in here which I liked, which we didn't include. Um, let me see. Yeah, this one here. I think there's a few variations. Um, but like I said, there are these two dimensions, right? You're looking at sort of the state control, and that's the x-axis. And then you're looking at the policies, which is the y-axis. And so really, this is sort of a scatter plot. It's just that those two dimensions are ordinal dimensions rather than quantitative dimensions. Um, and then you have small multiples by different policy areas. Um, but this was still a little bit <laughs> difficult to understand. Um, so that video was created uh, mostly automatically by this tool that we've built internally at the New York Times called Preview. And each of our graphics is backed by a Git repository. Um, those Git repositories exist on a server where Preview runs. And Preview can actually serve any graphic, any version of any graphic, um, live for you um, directly out of the Git repo. So it used to be the case that in order to show somebody else your work, you had to walk over, show them your laptop, or you had to explicitly make uh, what we called an internal shareable preview. And so the preview server was just designed to make that process easier and to sort of share everything by default, um, rather than you needing to explicitly do that. Um, because particularly if you're working out of San Francisco, like Sean and I, and now Jennifer and Josh and Michael, so we now have five people in San Francisco. Um, we're not in New York, so obviously we can't walk our laptop over very easily. It takes a little bit longer. Um, so we wanted to sort of make sharing easier to do. And you know, I've done a lot of open source work as well. I like the GitHub model. I like sharing stuff um, as blocks. And so I wanted to bring that and do that in, inside as well. Um, so the front page of Preview is actually this real-time updating list of all of our projects. It's infinitely scrollable. You can just keep paging down and see you know, projects going back, um, well, since we've started the preview server. Uh, and it updates throughout the day, so you can sort of see what the department is working on. Um, there's a crazy sort of Chrome extension, Git hook, duct tape system going on, which takes screenshots of every commit as it comes in, um, which is extremely helpful, right? It, it lets you see visually what people are working on, because oftentimes these um, these slugs are not that descriptive. Um, and then, of course, for any project that's in there, you can go in and you can click on it and you can see what it looks like. Um, so this is a project uh, that Josh was working on, Josh Williams. Um, and you can see there's a, there's a little toolbar there at the bottom, um, which has a drop-down menu, which lets you switch between branches. It also has previous and next links, so you can click backwards and see previous commits. Um, there's another feature, which is you can go see the history of that project as a visual summary. So it just gives you a screenshot of every commit. Now with this particular project, it's 
it's, you know, it's limited to that small window at the top, so you can't really see necessarily what's different. There's a lot more that we could do potentially, like looking at visual differences between commits or trying to do some aggregation of those to provide ve better visual summaries. So this is sort of more of a, a first pass, but it's still um, you know, extremely useful for being able to see what people are working on. Um, and the main benefit that this really provides for us is a way to get feedback more quickly. Um, because as we're doing this exploration, the goal is to really evaluate how successful we've been so far, whether we're going in the right direction or whether we should change. And one of the difficulties in doing that is that it's really hard for you to evaluate your own work because you're too close to it. You understand what it is that you're trying to do, and therefore you see the intent of what you've done, and that can influence your perception of it. If you show your work to somebody else who doesn't understand what you're trying to do, it's easier for them to sort of fairly evaluate it and see how successful you are because they don't have all of that context that you have. Um, they're just evaluating at face value like your readers will be evaluating it. Um, so having ways that people can sort of see your project without you asking for their feedback explicitly is very helpful. Um, like even if it's not feedback, like if you, if you think they're working on something cool and you want to get involved, you want to help them, you want to share an idea, um, you know, you want to make that a passive process rather than something that you have to ask for explicitly. Um, and as part of this evaluation process, I mean, you, you should also do it explicitly. Like one of the things that's helped me is to, to show graphics that I've been working on, you know, to my wife or to, to my friends, people that are not um, in the graphics department and might not have the same biases that we do. And just to try to understand if the visualization that I'm making or the graphic that I'm making communicates the way I expect it to do. Because that's really the goal of the graphic is to try to communicate something, to show something. Um, because these are you know, explanatory graphics that we're making and not exploratory generally. Like we want to, there's usually a point of the graphic that we're trying to communicate. And likewise, if we're building an interface for an interactive graphic, we want to make sure that that interface is discoverable. Um, that people understand how to use it. And so as we're doing this exploration, it's important to constantly evaluate how well we're doing and to verbalize what aspects of it that are working well and that are not working well so that if we end up changing paths, you know, we're not throwing everything away and starting over from scratch every time. It's really about learning and taking parts of graphics that work well and, parts, and removing the parts that aren't working well and sort of reformulating it and improving it as we go along. Um, so as I mentioned already, you know, we use Git repos for each of our graphics. So you should definitely be using Git or some source control for anything that you're doing. I mean, I don't know how like illustrators that just do everything in AI that would, and like keep files of different names. I mean, I would go insane. Um, so use Git liberally, use branches. Um, we have a habit of, well, branches are also nice and sort of from a social perspective because it gives you like a safe place to work on things that are potentially bad ideas. Um, like Sean has this habit of naming a branch controversy when <laughs> it's not likely to succeed or whatever where it may be controversial. Um, and so we service that also in the preview server, right? You, in the history, like those, those SHAs are, have bold names and they're also in the drop down menu. I mean, you can look at any commit, but obviously it's easier, you know, if you make the branches named so that people can explore them more easily. Uh, so this is another example. This was just a daily graphic that we worked on. So it's a much shorter history, but you can see that you know, there were a bunch of different variations that I tried down there at the bottom. Um, this was looking at, um, in, in Europe, a lot of the countries import energy from Russia, import oil and gas from Russia. And so this was looking at what percentage of their energy imports come from Russia. And so this is a discontiguous cartogram where the country is basically scaled around the centroid. So it's sort of, Whatever, it, this didn't work either. <laughs> um, but it was the first thing we tried. Um, so this is a different approach. We're using it's sort of like a Dorling cartogram. These are donut charts. Again, didn't really work. Um, and then this is roughly sort of the approach that we went with, which is a rectangular cartogram or a Demers cartogram. Um, I think they look a little bit like gas tanks, which is sort of funny. This one here? Either that one or the previous one. Actually, 
I want to be really included in plus as a cool <laughs> I think, I mean, I think it's harder to read, certainly, like, it's just in terms of a visual encoding. I mean, you're looking at, you're comparing two areas, so you're comparing the area of France in orange to the total area in, in gray. Um, and it's a little bit hard to do those comparisons with irregular shapes. And also doing an area comparison versus doing a, a position encoding, which is what this would be. So the position encoding is going to be more accurate. Um, and also, this is just more reductive, right? Like, you've got all of this geography here that really isn't communicating the information that you want to show with this graphic, right? Like, we don't care exactly about all the little islands that are in the United Kingdom. Um, I mean, it's, it's helpful to understand sort of a little bit of the geography. Obviously, you see that those, those countries that are right there on the Russian border are going to be importing more energy from Russia because it's easier for them. They're closer. Um, and as you get farther away, it becomes less common. And, and so really, it's sort of like just trying to reduce that and just focus on just the single variable that we want to show. Um. <laughs> All right, so I want to show another example here. I'll play this video, and I won't talk. So this is a graphic that we did on, on the variation in corporate tax rates across different sectors in the US. Just to show sort of how widely these things vary, um, you know, you have some companies which effectively pay no taxes whatsoever. You have other companies which pay, uh, they're sort of like in the NA category where they, they have negative profits, but they, end, uh, they have losses, but they still end up paying taxes. You can't really give that a particular percentage. And you have some companies that pay very high tax rates. So it's just like sort of all over the scale. Um, again, this is just a screenshot just for simplicity here in my slides. But you can click this button, and it expands out into those different sectors so that you can sort of see how the variation is correlated with those different sectors. So if I, like uh, this example, is sort of the exploded view. Um, now, you saw in this video here, sort of even after we kind of stabilize on this idea of using, um, I, I guess these are called B swarm plots, but the idea is, you know, it's essentially a one dimensional scatter plot, but then you use collision detection to push apart the circles so that they're not overlapping. Um, and so it, it sort of also forms this rough histogram so that you can see how the, the different corporate tax rates of companies are concentrated in these different bands. So even after we've stabilized on this particular design here, it's sort of like bouncing back and forth between these two things. Um, and that's because this branch, like we baked the force, lay the force layout. So there was another branch which was interactive and computed the positions automatically. Um, but then for the final uh, graphic, there was no real reason to have that dynamic. So we just um, exported those statically and baked it into the final graphic. Um, but you can see early on, you know, we tried all of these things that look nothing like the final graphic. Um, like this is just a scatter plot looking at market capitalization versus tax rate, and it looks like confetti. Um, we also had data for individual years. So this is a connected scatter plot um, on two log scales. Uh, it's just interesting to try to like explore it, right? And then, and then drawing lines here that are looking at the corporate tax rates. So again, this is um, one of the issues of looking at percentage tax rates is you've got these weird effects when you have negative or when you have losses rather than profits. And so what this is doing here is looking at cash taxes paid versus the, um, what does it say? Like, I think profits minus unusual items or something sort of financial terms. We tried some box plots. Um, you know, we tried like smaller sectors versus larger sectors. Um, this is actually like, I don't know if you can see in here, but there's a little visualization of how much the circles are getting moved away from where they want to be, which is trying to evaluate sort of the, um, the error that is introduced by this um, collision detection, because we're sort of biasing the results there uh, in order to not have those circles overlap, and we want to understand how that is affecting the accuracy of the chart. 
Um, so again, even though you can see that this is stabilizing here, um, it's a little bit misleading from this video because there are many more changes that are happening um, at the end more quickly once we've sort of stabilized on the design. Whereas early on, you know, the commits are farther apart, but we're trying much, much wider variations in our graphic ideas. Um, so I guess I'll show one more, but just very quickly. Anyone know what this one is? <laughs> I don't know why these are stopping. I'll try that again. All right, so now you can see it's got the title. So this was the sort of Sankey diagram um, history of uh, NCAA Division I football conferences, so looking at how schools changed their affiliation over the last, uh, I think, 60 years or something like that. Um, so early on, like, the layout changes dramatically, but then by this point, we've basically sort of stabilized on the form. And there were two main insights during this exploration. Um, one was that we would use the vertical layout so that it starts by reading the current um, affiliation and then it moves backwards in time, which sort of helps in the readability of the graphics, starting with the thing that's most relevant and then moving backwards in time sort of as long as you want to go. Whereas doing the horizontal layout, sort of you're going to start by reading in 1950 or something like that and sort of less relevant to people. Um, and the second big insight from this graphic was really about the color encoding. So you can see early on, you know, I'm trying different color encodings. Like this is coloring by the originating conference. Um, this is coloring by the conference, which is sort of redundant with the position. Um, and then at some point here, there's this realization that we should color the switches rather than coloring the conference. Uh, and this was really Sean's insight. Uh, and I think it's interesting because, you know, we think from visualization, you know, you have all of these different dimensions of data. And so it's just a question of like, which dimension am I going to assign to which encoding? But in this case, you know, the swap isn't really an explicit dimension. It's a secondary aspect of it. Um, but the reason that it's being highlighted here is because that's really the, the important part of the story, which is that more recently, and again, you're not seeing it because it's a very tall graphic, um, there are many more switches than there have been historically. And that is ultimately about um, these television contracts and really the conferences being less about sort of geographic locality and more about sort of business arrangementships and, and whether it's what, what's most profitable for the different schools and conferences to be successful and how they want to associate themselves. All right. So as we're doing this exploration, the other things you should keep in mind are that your prototype only exists so that you can learn something. It's not supposed to be a final graphic, so they don't have to look good. Um, they don't have to be polished. They don't have to be understandable. They don't have to be, have labels. Like every time you make a prototype, you should know in your head like what is, what is the prototype trying to show you? What are you trying to learn from that? You have a hypothesis as to, you have a hypothesis that, you're, that you are testing with your prototype. And it doesn't really need to do anything more than that. And then likewise, as you get farther along in your process, you kind of have to switch a little bit because obviously we have deadlines. At some point, we need to publish something. And we can't keep exploring wildly as we get closer to that deadline. So you need to transition smoothly as you start to identify what is working well and how much time you have left. Uh, and in a way, this process is sort of like um, simulated annealing. And simulated annealing is this algorithm for you know, finding the global maximum of some particular system. And it has a concept of temperature. So at the beginning, the exploration is very hot. So you're willing to take bad ideas, more likely. You're willing to spend more time sort of exploring. And then as you get farther along, your system starts cooling down. And you do a little bit less exploration because you're sort of committing more to your idea. And so part of the art of design here is, is figuring out sort of at what point you are in your process, how much time you have left, and whether you should start slowing down or whether you can continue to explore. Um, another aspect of it is, you know, if you want to move quickly, you have to delete code as you go along because you're going to be making mistakes. There are going to be branches that you're exploring that, that are not going to work. I mean, you think about it as like being a chef, right? If you're going to make a fancy dinner, uh, you're going to try 20 recipes to figure out what you want to serve. You know, do you want to like do all of your kitchen cleanup the night of your dinner or do you want to do it as you go along? Um, so this is sort of something that we're still learning. This is the, so we launched the upshot. 
um, on Tuesday, and I was helping out with the Senate model, so we did this visualization of our Senate forecasts. Um, so guess when I got involved with this project? <laughs> so okay, green is the number of lines added, and red is the number of lines deleted. Sorry, there are no labels. I suck at visualization. Um, <laughs> So yeah, so and if I just like highlight my involvement, I actually still deleted more code from this project than I added, so I was a net, ag net negative to this project. Um, but it just shows you like you know how much detritus you accumulate as you do all of this exploration, and it helps for my sanity to try to like continue pruning constantly as I'm as I'm going along. Um, and then this is a tweet from Kevin. May you all have the pleasure of waking up to this wonderful automated message from Emboss Doc. Delete all dead code. That's from our base camp. Um, and then another aspect, I mean, there, there are lots of things. I, I only have like a minute left. I can't sort of give you all of my advice. Um, but you know, I, I have an article about using make or using a build system. And that's really about making yourself more efficient as well, so that if you have parts that you want to reuse from other projects, it's easier for you to go back and make them work again. You, know, you want to keep that library of examples, uh, things that you can reuse. Um, so, you should go read that article on my website if you haven't already. It's called Why Use Make. Um, and then, of course, you know you have to try these bad ideas as you're going along. Um, and I think that that's particularly true in visualization because you can't really evaluate an idea without applying it to real data. Right? You, you may have something that you think works well, but there are characteristics of the, your data set that might make that idea work well or not work well. And so you really have to try it in order to evaluate it. But at the same time, you can't get too attached to whatever you, is your current favorite approach. You don't want to get stuck at that local maximum, right? You have to be willing to give up that idea and, and try something else. Um, so lastly, just don't be afraid to fail, because there's, there are too many unknowns in this space for you to sort of succeed perfectly on that linear path um, to your goal. And so you should be willing to try things that don't work and don't be afraid or don't get upset when they don't work because they invariably won't work. But it will all be okay in the end. Okay, thank you.